Right. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, we know this was a last minute switch. Um, I just want to make sure everyone's aware. Dr. O'Connor and his team, everybody is, he is healthy. There's no issues there. I know there's some concern. It was a logistical issue. They are uh, planning to do a, a webinar through some platform in the month of May, uh, but they extremely apologize for the last minute hiccup. I also, in advance, want to thank everybody that is part of this tonight to make this happen. Uh, this came together in about 25 hours. We found out at 5.30 Eastern time yesterday. So I want to thank everybody. I want to thank everybody who's online right now, as everyone else who will be joining us tonight, as well as for Dr. Mountjoy's talk, which will start at 9.15 uh, Eastern. Let's see if I can move the slides. Andy's slide moving there we go so what we're going to talk about tonight is uh amsm our mem members on the front lines and, and we're all in this together obviously this is a virtual version we can't be together but we thought this was the next best option um what our challenges have been is how best to convey how we're all working together as one um and really this is the the best idea that we can come up with um, on such short notice so the question is, why this topic? And this is our new normal for now. We want to highlight amazing, selfless work done by our members, what we're doing for our patients, for our loved ones, uh, as well as for all of us. And so we thank every single one of us, all of our members. And that really starts with our team in Kansas City. For those of you who are not aware, our staff in Kansas City has done such an amazing job. Many of you aren't even aware of the hours, the sleepless nights to not only put together a conference every year and everything else that goes on, but then switching to a new conference virtually that has never been done in 29 years on six weeks notice. So if you get an opportunity, please send an email, please send a text, pick up the phone and call Jim. Jody, Michelle, Joan, Kristen, Andy, and Ellen. Um, we thank you, all of our membership. Um, you've done such an amazing, amazing job. The lineup for tonight, um, after I get done with my introductions of everyone, uh, Dr. Oshlag gave a fantastic talk the other night, and we're going to put that on again. Um, it'll be a video form of life in the ED during a pandemic. Then the remainder of our panelists um, will talk for about five or six minutes each of some personal experiences they may want to show. Then we have Dr. Anthony Romeo as our special guest who I'll introduce in a moment on personal recollections of dealing with COVID. And then if we have time, a few more questions and a little bit of a wrap up. I want to make sure that we finish up no later than 9.05 p.m. Eastern time because we'll have to log off and get onto the other uh, site or other window, I should say, for Dr. Mountjoy's talk, which Dr. Melissa Novak will be moderating and will start promptly at 9.15 Eastern. So if for those of you who saw the email that Andy Meyer sent out today with the e-blast, um, we asked for members to send in pictures of unique instances instances of things that they may not have been doing um, in their normal job description. As we're trying to load the slides, there are many pictures that we have right now of members that are not recognizable. They're in masks, they're in gowns, they're with eye covers, and it, it's really quite amazing the amount of pictures that we got in less than one hour. Um, we want to apologize for those of you who said everyone is aware that all, all of us, our entire membership, is so appreciative of everything that all of us are doing, in particular those that are repurposed, maybe doing things. How about now? Do you guys hear me now? Yeah, I'll pick up for Jason. He seems to be having a few technical difficulties. Um, so what he was trying to show here is we asked some folks to send in some uh, pictures of them working on the front line and how different life has become for, for many of us very quickly. Um, 
I think that was about the only additional introduction information he had. Yeah, so we're going to move on to the video from uh, Dr. Oshlag. Um, I think this was shown the other night, but it'll be a chance for many who missed it the first time around. So Andy Meyer, are you able to get his video started? Uh, I'm Ben Oshlag. Uh, I did my fellowship back in 2015-16. I've been in New York since then. I was at Columbia for a few years doing about 50-50 EM and sports. And then last fall, I moved across town to one of the Mount Sinai hospitals, uh, currently doing 100% EM, which is interesting in this time, uh, with the idea of adding back in some sports, but obviously that's on the back burner for now. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about Uh, I'm Ben Oshlag. Uh, I did my fellowship back in, was it 2015, 16? I've been in New York since then. I was at Columbia for a few years doing about 50-50 EM and sports. And then last fall, I moved across town to one of the Mount Sinai hospitals, uh, currently doing 100% EM, which is interesting in this time, uh, with the idea of adding back in some sports, but obviously that's on the back burner for now. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about just in general, what we've seen in New York, uh, what I've seen specifically uh, at my hospital and my personal experiences, and then uh, talk about the medical side of things, what we've learned, uh, you know, difficulties we've we've run into, uh, and uh, and what little we actually feel like we know about this disease. Which the more I learn about it, the less I understand it. Uh, so to start, just to to run through, uh, really, uh, we have sort of the pre-surge, the surge, and then starting to get into the post-surge. Uh, in New York, the beginning of March, um, sort of slow for everyone to, to recognize that this was becoming a problem. Uh, our, the first case actually came through our hospital system, although not my particular hospital, but was very well contained. Uh, we don't think she spread it to anyone. But the second case uh, was likely community spread, it was a, a lawyer who worked in the suburbs and commuted into the city. Uh, and he was really the first one that kind of got the almost sort of panic started. Uh, in the city with people coming in looking for tests and people starting to really get worried about it. Uh, and you can look at, look and see that that was pretty well founded as we go through, you know, one or two cases in the first few days to all of a sudden up to a thousand cases uh, two weeks into March uh, and starting to get that exponential growth. And as it started to happen, we did get a, a reasonably good response from our, our state and local governments uh, starting to shut down universities, uh, shutting down mass gatherings, Broadway shutting down, all the sports shutting down uh, before the federal government sort of got their their act together. Well, I won't even say act together, but but started, started doing things. Um, and then about midway through the month, we started to see our first deaths uh, from this. Uh, and there's actually a, a lot of conflict between uh, the New York City government and the state government in terms of when to close schools, when to close bars and restaurants. Uh, and there were a lot of logistical uh, arguments back and forth with that. Um, but that started to happen sort of in the middle of the month. Um, and then we got our statewide shelter in place, uh, trying to really keep everyone home uh, towards the last week or so of, of March. Uh, and then the last last week of March is really when things started to look like all the horrible stories that we had heard uh, about from Italy. Uh, and we really started to need all of the help uh, and all the resources that we had been trying to, to scrape together before then. Um, so moving forward to, to looking at my March, um, I actually saw a patient on March 4th who was a, a young, healthy girl, had been to Italy to, to plan her wedding, had been not in, I think the worst area was Milan, uh, but she had been in Florence, but had a friend actually sick in Milan who came down to visit them, left because he was feeling sick and went back. Uh, and she had come back, she was feeling fatigued, had a sore throat. She wasn't really sure was this because I took an international flight or was this because I have COVID. Um, so we, you know, this was early on. She was the sort of like, uh, you know, a spectacle of a patient. We had her mask, had her in an isolation, negative pressure room, uh, talking through her to, the, to her through the door, over the phone. Uh, at that point, we only had the Department of Health to test uh, and they, they wouldn't test her. Uh, the, the protocol at that point was to test people for flu and then uh, a general viral panel, and you had to get all of that back negative before they would consider a test. Uh, but they actually told me that because her friend had not 
had a confirmed positive COVID, uh, that they wouldn't test her. Uh, so she may have had it, she may have not had it. Uh, she was there for several hours waiting for tests to come back uh, and then went home. Um, and really for the next week or so, we, we didn't have much, uh, much testing. Um, the middle of the month, I actually went away. It was my wife's birthday on the 12th. Uh, so we had a, a sort of a midweek few days away. And then the time we were away, the landscape completely changed. Uh, I remember watching the news and, uh, and looking for updates and seeing just uh, everything shutting down, the city set it shutting down, sports shutting down uh, in that time frame. And at the same time, having you know, conference calls, faculty meetings uh, with my hospital about what we were doing in terms of changing staffing, changing the layout of the ER, trying to prepare for what we saw as a surge. Uh, and actually these slides, uh, what's in the, the, the last line should, should be a, up a little bit. Um, Cause we did all that sort of the, that second and third week uh, of the, uh, of March, uh, you know, adding in extra shifts, adding in extra coverage, our hospital system um, developed its own uh, tests or bought, bought tests to run in house. So we were no longer uh, reliant on the department of health uh, to run all of our testing uh, and can test whoever we wanted. Um, just to give a, a brief overview, I won't go through all of this in detail, but, before COVID, uh, we had two acute pods and one fast track pod, uh, full attendings uh, 24 hours a day and the acute pods and then fast track just 10 hours a day, but an EM attending covering that with PAs. Uh, for COVID, the fast track pod was actually most equipped uh, to expand and, and create uh, negative pressure rooms. It actually had previously had rooms that were then turned into offices. They were turned back into rooms. Uh, we increased the tending coverage. PEDS was actually great in, in reaching out to us and saying, you know, we're not seeing a lot of kids right now. We need more patients. We'll take anyone up to 30 as long as it's not intox or psych and if they don't have COVID. Uh, so they're taking a lot of our, our young appies, our, our young pelvic pain, things like that. Um, we also were donated additional residents from podiatry and ophthalmology. Uh, and then when things got really bad towards the end of March, um, we, we had extra teams um, from the ICU and from the inpatient teams just to manage our borders. Uh, one th unique thing about our hospital, which kind of made our experiences a little bit different from, from some of the stories you may have heard, um, is that we, our hospital is in the, the process of closing down our current building and over the next couple of years, moving to a building down the street. So we had a lot of empty floors, uh, just a lot of physical space that was already a hospital. Uh, that we could then uh, reopen, uh, you know, higher staffing. And our, our hospital system sent out requests for anyone recently retired, anyone uh, who had left the system recently to, to bring them back in. Um, and, you know, obviously if they were older at risk and not put them on the COVID floors initially, although eventually everything was a COVID floor, uh, and to, to shift other staffing around. And we were able to not only take all the patients that we were getting through the the ER, but also from other hospitals uh, in the area. And I just want to go back one slide. If you look, this was from March 27th, uh, one of the, the days that I was working in our, our COVID pod. Um, this is one hour, and this is not necessarily an atypical hour uh, for, for that time. Um, this is, you know, 10, 11, 12 uh, people all just cough, fever, um, shortness of breath, uh, your typical COVID symptoms. Um, and they just kept coming and coming and coming. Um, this is what I look like on a, on a normal day now. Um, so an N95 mask with a surgical mask on top with the idea being that the surgical mask, you can, uh, you can change um, instead of having to change the N95 mask unless you do something high risk. Uh, and then a face shield, gown gloves, hair, color, hair cover and shoe covers. Uh, and you know, except for the, the gown, which we don't wear in the charting area, I'm, I'm in this. Uh, pretty much the entire shift. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about my routine. Um, so the, the subways closed down in the middle, of, or it's not the subways didn't close down, the, uh, the parking regulations were shut down in the middle of March. Uh, so instead of taking the subway, I can now drive. There's no traffic and I can park anywhere I want. Uh, so it's a little safer and faster to do that. So I drive to work, uh, get a mask. Uh, we have a locker room outside the ED. And so anything that went home with me didn't go into the ED except for my clothes and my phone. Uh, and then uh, I'd walk in with the mask into the, the ED and put on the full PPE, like you saw from the last, last slide. Uh, after my shift, I'd leave the ED, wash my hands, take off my PPE, wash my hands again, change my clothes into a second pair of clothes that I brought with me. 
uh, wash my hands again, pack my bag, wash my hands again, because they had just packed up all the dirty clothes, get a new surgical mask uh, on the way home, drive home, and then on getting home, uh, immediately shower and throw everything I had taken with me into the laundry, even the clothes that I just only worn home. Uh, you know, I don't know if this is overkill, but so far I haven't gotten sick. Uh, we actually, we have, uh, we're running a, a test on uh, for uh, convalescent plasma through our hospital system. And so I was tested for antibodies a couple of weeks ago and hadn't, didn't have antibodies because I had a, I thought maybe I was, had some, some big symptoms or asymptomatic, but, uh, so far I haven't gotten sick, thankfully. Uh, moving on into April, um, you know, we had been promised a, a ship, uh, and also a convention center being turned into hospitals and those did eventually open. Um, initially, they, they thought that they were going to have them be for non-COVID patients, which was laughable uh, if you saw what we were seeing, which was anything and everything could be COVID and, and people with nothing could be COVID positive. Uh, so the odds that they were going to uh, skirt through and have no one, uh, no one who was infected uh, be in either of those places uh, just wasn't going to happen. Um, and we were still seeing exponential growth uh, through, you know, doubling every two to three days through the, the first week in, in April. Um, looks like if you look at the numbers, it peaks probably around the fourth or the fifth. Um, and then since then, we've had a little bit of a period uh, where, oops, sorry, let's go back, um, where it's been busy um, for maybe the, the week that in the middle, of that second week of April. But you could kind of see that it wasn't quite as horrific as it was before then. Um, and in the last week or so, we've actually seen such a significant drop off in the number of uh, number of patients. We've cut our extra shifts and we're actually cutting, uh, closing our fast track entirely uh, to try to save on on staffing that we don't need. Um, I worked a fast track shift last last week and I saw uh, two patients in the first four hours total um, and then ended up with a, a sick COVID patient that wasn't supposed to be there, uh, but the other pods were getting a little, a little overwhelmed. Um, the other thing we tried to do was set up a tent. You can see the tent in the picture there. Um, initially, the idea was that it, that was going to be for sort of the, the walking dischargeable COVID. Um, but then they decided to change it to they were going to have uh, outpatient doctors staff it. Uh, and then actually, by the time they got it up and running and ready to go, we didn't need it. So right now, it's, uh, it's actually a, a break room where we can socially distance because our current break room is very small. And it's actually the scariest place I go into, I think. Uh, because you can't wear your PPE in the break room because everyone's afraid you're going to get it dirty. So you're sitting close to everyone uh, without PPE and you don't, you're don't. you around a bunch of people who uh, are exposed to COVID patients pretty frequently. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, shift gears, uh, talk about the medicine uh, of COVID. And well, actually, these are my slides are a little out of order. So what we see most commonly are the, you know, the common, common symptoms, cough, fevers, body ache, shortness of breath. Uh, GI symptoms are fairly common. Um, and I don't think I could recognize a normal chest X-ray anymore because they all look like this. Uh, almost every single chest X-ray I get, even on somebody for a slip and fall, has these bilateral diffuse patchy infiltrates. Uh, I think radiology is just copying and pasting um, their reads. Uh, instead of you know no acute disease, it, it says bilateral infiltrates. Uh, but Uncommonly, you can see anything and have it be COVID. I've seen seizure, I've seen stroke. I haven't personally seen STEMI, but I've seen end STEMIs. I saw one woman who came in, her initial trope was 0.3, and six hours later, it was 62. Um, no changes on her EKG. Uh, and you know, part of this disease seems to be uh, a hypercoagulability and microthrombi that we don't quite understand yet. Um, that I think plays into a lot of it. I've seen uh, you know acute renal failure, people, with normal kidneys who are suddenly on dialysis, uh, syncope arrhythmias. Um, the hip fracture I saw was interesting. It was one of our, our normal intox drunks who's there frequently. He came in unresponsive. He woke up screaming that his leg hurt. Turns out he had passed out from the alcohol that it's normally okay with because he had COVID uh, and he broke his hip. Um, let's see, can we get back? Um, so in terms, but the, you know, as interesting as this disease seems to be academically, uh, from a decision standpoint, for me, uh, it's been pretty straightforward. Uh, and I talk about, you know, here what medicine wants to know. They want EKG, chest X-ray, VBG, CBC, BMP, UA, LFTs, coags, um, inflammatory markers, Procal, D-dimer, LDH, ferritin. They want Legionellas, and you know, I, this I find hilarious because if we are 
unlucky enough to get a Legionella outbreak in the middle of all this nonsense. Uh, I, I think there's just there's just no going back. Um, only thing I want to know is their their O2 sat um, and how they're breathing. If they're 94 or above, they go home. If they're under 94, uh, and I do ambulatory pulse oxes on people because uh, I have had a number of people who are in that 94 to 96 range, and then you walk them and they drop to 88. Um, then you start oxygen. You admit them, uh, and if they look if they look sick, um, you know, high flow oxygen, proning people, uh, which has actually been uh, almost a lifesaver, and probably literally a lifesaver, but you know, resource management wise, uh, very helpful also for us. Uh, or uh, in the worst case, uh, you know, intubating them in the ER. Um, you know, other things that we've learned about the medicine of this. So early intubation is not the answer. That's what we were doing at the beginning. We thought, you know, these people are probably going to need to be intubated anyway. We don't want to do it uh, when they're extremely in distress. We don't want them on the floor and having to call an anesthesia team. Let's just go ahead and do it uh, and get them stabilized, get them on like ARDS protocols. Uh, and people weren't doing well with that. Uh, they were never getting off the vent. Uh, their lungs were getting worse. Um, and actually, if, uh, you look at um, the way that the lungs function in this disease, it's sort of like ARDS, but it's not ARDS. Uh, the compliance of the lungs remains normal. You don't necessarily need the high PEEP, uh, and the PEEP actually may be dangerous um, and causing worsening of their, their lung disease. Um, and actually prolonging intubation or delaying intubation uh, can be uh, you know, one of the better things that you can do for your patients. And again, if, if they're able to prone themselves, um, you know, I had one patient who came in, he was like 74 percent on room air, got up to like low 80s on, on a non-rebreather. I flipped him on his stomach and he was at 96. Still in the non-rebreather, but he was at 96 and, you know, just laying there chilling out on his stomach. Uh, and, you know, if they can avoid intubation, then great. But also if you're talking about resource management and you can delay intubation by two days, even a day, 12 hours, uh, then when you look at your ventilator days as a unit and, and how many you have available, then you've saved that many. Uh, and if you do that for 50 patients for half a day each, you save 25 days on a ventilator. Uh, you know, looking at the, the medicine treatment side of things, um, I think that, you know, some of the newer studies looking at the hydroxychloroquine and the azithromycin uh, show probably no benefit. Uh, I was actually, I signed up for Minnesota's study doing pre-exposure prophylaxis with the hydroxychloroquine and I stopped taking it. Uh, I, I, I was getting some side effects from it. And, uh, you know, if it's not going to be a benefit, I, I don't want to put myself at risk there. Um, some of the, the other medicines, the tocilizumab, the remdesivir, the convalescent plasma, you know, there's not enough data to say uh, whether or not those uh, are going to be helpful or not. I have a feeling that probably something out there is, um, but we don't know what. Uh, so I think, you know, part of where we have to go from this is learning uh, which of those medicines help and which ones don't. Um, the other thing that we started in our hospital system is anticoagulating people. And again, we're seeing people who are clotting all over the place and, and actually a lot of increase in deaths uh, not brought to the hospital. Our EMS system has been overwhelmed with just uh, dead on arrival type of patients uh, that we think are either PEs or arrhythmias or MIs uh, that just people uh, just clot and, and die. Um, so people who get admitted to the hospital are now getting uh, pretty much empiric anticoagulation, not just your your typical sub-Q heparin, but um, getting Lovenox, getting Eloquis, um, or going on heparin drips. Um, and uh, you know we don't have outcomes yet, but I, I think that it's probably gonna end up being helpful. Um, difficulties that we've run into. I've actually felt very lucky in terms of PPE. I know that's been a huge issue at a lot of different hospitals and nationwide, just trying to make sure that you have the masks, that you have the gowns. Uh, my hospital system was able to secure a pretty large order, um, but we're still trying to conserve. What we do uh, is that we have the N95 mask. If you can make it through a full shift of the N95, then great. If you do anything to get it dirty, go, do anything to get it bent, or if you do anything high risk. So if you are if you are intubating, uh, if you're in a room with someone uh, who has to be on, on BiPAP or CPAP, although we're really trying to avoid those things, uh, then you would switch it after that. Um, we're also not doing any nebulizers anywhere for, for our entire ED. So uh, some of our chronic asthma patients are, are upset about that, but just to sort of minimize the, the risk of aerosolization. Um, but we're still short, you know, 
it's hard to find the right gowns. Um, the gowns that we have aren't necessarily great for aerosolizing procedures. They're not the uh, the really uh, thick, good ones. Um, and and we have had to conserve. Um, you know, I think that we did a fairly good job in terms of planning ahead for changing around our spaces and changing around our staffing. Uh, but one problem that we ran into that we knew we were going to run into is most of our rooms are curtain rooms. Um, and we were able to put up you know, four rooms we turned from curtains into doors, and we were able to convert a couple offices into extra extra rooms. Um, but having rooms where you can truly isolate patients became difficult. And that, essentially, what we did is our that fast track pod. Uh, we made a hot zone, and we had a lot of COVID patients just sitting behind curtains, and we'd be in full PPE, even just uh, sitting at the desk doing our charts. Um, in terms of intubation strategies, uh, you know, trying to minimize the number of people in the room, having the most experienced person do it, uh, because it's not something where you want to be hunting around um, and and really up in someone's face. Uh, trying to use video because again, it puts you farther away from the patient. Uh, the boxes uh, we have not quite that nice of a version of the box, and I didn't. I've only uh, intubated a couple of. Of patients before we, we shifted to trying to delay uh, intubation and, and since then really haven't needed to. Um, so I haven't used the box, um, but it does, uh, I think, probably do a pretty good job at, at limiting uh, the arthritization. And then your approach with your RSI is to really just uh, knock them out, um, use super high doses. Um, I use, uh, typically would use ketamine. Um, I had a couple of, the couple of patients I intubated, their pressures were a little soft uh, to begin with, so I didn't want to do anything too sedating. Um, but And considering you can't really overdose someone on ketamine, just giving them massive amounts uh, of that and rocuronium uh, to get them out fast uh, and make sure that you don't have run into issues if it does take longer that you need to, to resedate them. Um, in terms of staffing, uh, I mentioned that we had you know, the extra residents and peds. The other thing that we did, and this is sort of a mutual decision between us and our, our faculty, we had a couple of faculty members uh, who were in their sort of 60s, uh, early 70s, even even older 50s, who uh, we just decided, you know, mutually, we're, gonna, we're taking it off the schedule. It's just not worth it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I think that that probably for safety's sake, you know, we've had, even in our healthcare system, one of our our nurse managers at another hospital did did uh, did die after uh, getting COVID. So um, you know the risk is certainly real. I think uh, only one of our faculty members that I know of has tested positive. Um, he was out for a couple of days. He's actually back working now. Had a pretty mild, uh, thankfully, uh, course. Um, testing again. I've I felt lucky uh, with our hospital system. We have our own tests. We actually even now uh, for a while. We're, I'm at a, at a satellite site uh, on the Lower East Side. The main sign is in the Upper East, uh, and all of our COVID swabs would go up there. Uh, now, if we, we do need them back uh, quickly, we have uh, the ability to do even rapid ones within a couple hours um, to come back. Otherwise, they go uptown, but they still come back within usually 12 to 16 hours. Uh, we do want to run into issues there with, with patients who are admitted because we have a, a step-down unit um, that is in an ICU that are both COVID negative, um, which is basically the only COVID negative part of the hospital. So you have to wait and get uh, a negative test before they can go there. Um, and if you have any suspicion at all, or you know, the false negative rates have been extremely high. Um, so sometimes you may need two or even three negatives. And I've had patients actually with three negatives that I still don't believe. Uh, you know, in my approach with testing, as soon as I was allowed to test people, I was testing as many people uh, as often as I could. Uh, you know, they told us only test people where you're admitting, but I was testing people and sending them home because I felt like, from a personal perspective, you know, people are going to take self isolation more seriously if they've been tested. If someone is told in the ER, uh, you know, it's not even worth testing you, just go home and isolate, they're very unlikely to isolate. Uh, and then from a public health perspective, you know, we need data. We need to know what's going on. Um, so the last, I, I've made my own uh, sort of list and epic to keep track. Uh, the last time I checked, I had tested 171 people and 112 of those were positive, um, at least. And I know some of those were, were false negatives, some of the negatives, because I would have multiple family members from the same household with the same symptoms come in. They both get tested and one would be positive and one would be negative. 
Um, so I guarantee you the number was higher. And I remember, you know, going back through just shift by shift. There were a couple shifts where, you know, I test 20 people and 19 of them would be positive. Um, you know, literally everybody had COVID. Um, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, one of the things we were able to do uh, was accept transfers, uh, but our hospital doesn't have anything. Uh, it doesn't have everything in terms of, uh, you know, specialties. Um, so we do a, a lot of transferring out also, which has become a lot harder um, because a lot of times you don't have anyone to accept your transfer. Uh, consults as well. A lot of our consult services aren't coming to the ER. Uh, so we even had uh, a STEMI that cardiology would not take to the cath lab, would not uh, come down to the ER to see uh, because the person had a, a COVID positive contact at home. Uh, and they actually said give lytics and admit uh, to the ICU um, and refuse to cath somebody. Um, so it has been an issue. Um, one of the other issues we've run into uh, has been with at-risk populations. And I'll separate this out to two kind of sub subsets. One is our homeless population. Um, so I don't know if you caught this back a few slides ago. This, this x-ray here, I didn't mention it at the time, but if you look at the date on that x-ray, it actually says February 26th. This is COVID. This x-ray 100% is COVID. Um, this was a patient I saw who came from the shelter system. Uh, I saw him in April. Um, and on his chest x-ray that day, it said almost fully resolved multifocal pneumonia. So I looked, uh, I looked to see what, um, sorry, I looked to see, you know, what his old x-ray had been. Um, and this is very clearly COVID and it's not day one COVID. This is day five, day 10 COVID. And he was coming from our shelter system. So this thing has been endemic in our city, um, for a very long time. Uh, much longer than we had initially thought. And then that matches up with what we've seen um, in the uh, in the new data coming out of California. So yeah, one of the, the issues with this, uh, this outbreak, especially in New York, uh, has been the populations that it's hit the hardest. Uh, and if we go to the slide here, um, what you're seeing here is uh, basically COVID infection rates uh, in the New York City uh, in the five boroughs of New York. Um, you know, obviously the darkest red is the worst hit areas. Um, and then the stars are hospitals. It's not a complete list of hospitals because I was manually putting those on there. Um, but, uh, you know, the hospital I'm at is the solid blue star uh, in the lower east side of Manhattan. The red and yellow stars are the public hospitals. Um, and, the, you know, uh, the one that was hit the, the worst that there was a New York Times article is Elmhurst. It's the one right under uh, where it says uh, Queens. Um, that's, you know, they had 13 deaths in 24 hours on, I believe it was March 26th. Um, and if you look, you know, the hospitals up in the Bronx, the hospitals uh, deep in Brooklyn, those are the ones that were like war zones, that were like third world, um, completely overwhelmed, um, really just, you know, running out of ventilators, running out of PPE, uh, people dying kind of, uh, you know, just in the ER left and right. Um, if you look at the area around the blue star where I am, you know, I felt sometimes that I am in a completely different world, that I am not seeing the epidemic that other people are seeing. We're busy, but we're not overwhelmed. And it's been, you know, you know, on, on the one hand, I, I know that a lot of people across the country haven't seen anyone with COVID or you see two or three people and I've seen hundreds, literally hundreds, but I, you know, I still feel like there's an order of magnitude difference uh, between Manhattan and between Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. Uh, and a lot of that is uh, socioeconomic, its ability to socially distance. It's the ability to get the message about what to do translated into the hundreds of different languages that people speak, um, especially in Queens. There are people from over 100 countries that live in a few block uh, areas in, the, in that area of Queens. And, and Elmer's is their public hospital, uh, and they're living uh, and very tight quarters and they're working jobs that they can't afford not to work uh, and that are considered essential in a lot of times. They're the people running their transportation systems. They're the people working at all the restaurants. There's the people, um, you know, stocking the grocery stores, working the checkout lines, and they're the people who are dying uh, in a lot of the cases. Um, and so, you know, I felt, you know, in, in some ways in the middle of this and then other days I felt like, I'm not helping because I'm sitting at a hospital that is not overwhelmed, uh, that you know is reasonably well equipped, that has a lot of good support, 
Um, and I work with, uh, you know, some of our attendings also work at Elmhurst and work at places in Brooklyn and at some of the other Sinai sites in Queens and Brooklyn and, uh, or, you know, some of the hospitals in the Bronx. Um, and, you know, hearing their stories, it, it just sounds like a different world to me. Um, so it's it's been very interesting in that regard to feel like on the one hand, I'm in the middle of things and on the other hand, I'm, I'm a world apart. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know what could have been done to to avoid uh, the situation that we got ourselves into, aside from maybe not disbanding our pandemic response team two years ago. Uh, but um, certainly, I think there are a lot of a lot of lessons uh, to be learned from it. Uh, and I think that a lot of what you need to know, you can see uh, kind of on the map uh, that's up there now. Um, I will say, when I'm not at work, um, I do like to practice social distancing and uh, and staying at home. Uh, this is my now almost 11 month old uh, on his first trip to the park. Uh, well, first, it was actually his first encounter with grass, uh, which he was a little bit scared of, which was kind of cute. Um, but, you know, trying to keep him away. <laughs> my wife is asking if I asked permission for the picture. No, it says she took the picture. Um, but, you know, trying to, to stay away from other people and, and do our part when, when I'm not at work. Um, because that's really been, you know, we've seen a lot of improvement and especially the last week, you know, I can see, um, I can see the difference that it's made having people stay home. Uh, and especially even in our just normal ED volume is way down. Um, but I know that when things start to open back up, whether that's last week in the cases of some states or, you know, sometime in the next month or two, even in New York, that things are going to pick back up again. Uh, and so I think that it's important for us to use uh, the time that we have now uh, as things are a little bit slower to prepare for that uh, and to try to do you know, the best we can to, to help people uh, and to understand this disease better. Help people uh, and to understand this disease better. So I want to thank Dr. Oshlag. That was a, a fantastic talk. Um, the presenters, can you just give me a thumbs up if folks can hear me right now? All right. If my computer goes out, Dr. Peterson has agreed to take over. Um, I want to thank Dr. Oshlag. That was a tremendous talk. I think one of the more powerful talks I've personally heard in a while. I know everyone in the chat function is going um, pretty, pretty, pretty crazy in a good way right now. So thank you, Dr. Oshlag. Um, we're going to introduce the bios now for all of our presenters. Obviously, Dr. Oshlag just spoke and spoke so eloquently of, of kind of a firsthand account. Um, Dr. Julia Iafredi is an assistant professor of rehabilitation and regenerative medicine, especially in sports and dance medicine. She is at, affiliated with New York Presbyterian and Columbia University in New York City. She's board certified in sports medicine as well as physical medicine and rehabilitation and obviously is, is uh, done pretty well for herself. Um, the lower picture on that screen is probably my favorite picture I have seen in any social media platform uh, in the last two months. So I, I wanted to put that up there. <laughs> Next, Dr. J uh, Jeremiah Ray uh, on the West Coast. He is the director of intercollegiate athletic sport medicine at UC Davis, and he's the athletics head team physician. He's an emergency room physician. He's an assistant clinical professor in the departments of emergency medicine and PMR as well as a visiting clinical professor, uh, clinical faculty uh, professor in the orthopedic department at UC Davis as well. Next is Dr. Andy Peterson. Uh, he's a clinical associate professor at the University of Iowa in the Department of Orthopedics. He's the head team physician for the Hawkeyes and the director of primary care sports medicine. He's also on the AMSM board of directors. He is the co-chair of the research committee and is on the leadership team for the Collaborative Research Network. Dr. Daphne Scott is an assistant attending physician at HSS in New York. She's board certified in family medicine with a CAQ in sports medicine, and she is currently the team physician for the Winchester Knicks of the NBA G League, a consultant for UFC, and has served for Team USA track and field multiple times. And then as a special guest, um, Dr. Anthony Romeo. For those of you who don't know Dr. Romeo, he is the chief of orthopedics for the Rothman Orthopedic Institute's New York division. Um, he's a past president for ASES and the chief medical editor for Orthopedics Today. Um, distinguished orthopedic surgeon working in academic medicine for more than 20, uh, for more than two decades. Former team physician for the Chicago White Sox and the Chicago Bulls. And really one of the main reasons 
that we were fortunate enough, and I'm very appreciative that he agreed to come on, though he'll be on audio only, is Dr. Romeo, who has spoken about his personal dealings with COVID as a patient. He published on it. I, I put the site up. He was one of the first uh, 1,000 recovered cases in New York, and he's going to speak on this again by audio only um, the last 10 minutes or so before we do some Q&A. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, particularly for our residents and for our fellowship faculty, the virtual fellowship fair is tomorrow night to wrap up the virtual 2020 meeting it's from 8 o'clock to 10.30 p.m. on the Collaborate website. So what I th like to do, we'll just do this in alphabetical order. So we'll start with Dr. Iafredi. Uh, just they're going to speak for about five to six minutes and maybe something personal, some interaction or thing they have all dealt with. And from there, we'll go on to Dr. Romeo. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Hopefully. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, my name is Julia Iafredi. I am uh, normally a physiatrist who specializes in sports medicine in New York at Columbia. And obviously, uh, as Ben had mentioned in his talk, we got hit pretty hard uh, with COVID very early on. And so uh, kind of mid-March, uh, our, our entire outpatient clinic got completely shut down and we were asked to consider volunteering to be re deployed. Most of my colleagues ended up going to work for workforce health and safety or like doing um, cough and fever clinics um, or online uh, visits. And then um, myself, I volunteered to be redeployed into the ER ICU. So basically that was uh, a portion of the emergency room that got converted into an ICU because we were getting so many patients. And early on, we were intubating them early as, uh, as Ben had mentioned. And so we were managing these ICU patients down in the ER until we could redistribute them up to the ICU because um, at, at the Columbia campus that I work at uh, within NYP, we only had 64 ICU beds and we had to basically triple that amount. So we ended up uh, getting it up to about, I think, 190 beds. So our ORs were converted into ICUs, our ERs, everything. Um, because of that, I ended up transferring my practice into telehealth for two days, and then I was working uh, ER ICU for about three days a week, um, give or take. And then uh, in order to prepare, because obviously uh, in physiatry, I don't have to manage ventilators anymore. Um, we did get a lot of online education from some of our ICU colleagues, but that education was honestly changing every two or three days, because as we were learning more, it was changing the way we were managing things. And so I actually only ended up working uh, like two or three shifts in the ER ICU before we were transitioned out of the ER and into the OR um, as an ICU there. And so that's where we're managing 100% COVID patients that are all intubated um, and trying to get them, you know, uh, weaned off the ventilators and hopefully uh, drop down to one of the other floors. Um, which has been really, um, honestly, very interesting. It's uh, I was functioning basically as a resident again when it comes right down to it. We had an overseeing ICU attending that was covering like a pod of the ORs. And then each OR suite had about four to six patients in it. And then you'd have uh, two uh, residents, an attending that was an off-service attending. So either myself or a radonc attending or opto or ortho or something like that. Usually a lot of the surgical specialties, uh, urology as well. And then um, a neurosurgery fellow usually or ICU fellow was kind of like our head above uh, uh, myself. And then we'd have the overseeing um, ICU doctor. And so that's kind of how we made it work. And it worked generally well for us for the most part. Um, in terms of PPE, I agree with Ben. We were really lucky uh, that we, you know, NYP is a humongous hospital uh, system. And so we did have enough PPE, but we were still trying to conserve as much as possible, uh, only getting one N95 mask per shift. Uh, unfortunately for a lot of the smaller people in the practice or um, people with smaller faces, uh, we were running out of small N95s and obviously an N95 is not an N95 if it doesn't fit your face properly. So I actually ran into some issues where I couldn't find an N95 that fit my face anymore, um, which was a little bit problematic. And then we were also noticing that because they had switched into um, making so many more N95s, uh, we actually ended up running out of gowns because apparently they, it's the same um, the same product is, or the same uh, materials are being used to make the gown. So we actually had a little incident with that, uh, which was uh, a little bit problematic. 
And then the other thing that um, we've noticed now as things have started to taper down in, in our ICUs is the inpatient rehab units, which my call, my inpatient colleagues obviously are, are covering, um, are getting really, really busy. And we're taking on patients that are either still COVID positive or have had COVID and were intubated for 30 days and finally came off a ventilator and now are being you know transferred over to the um, inpatient rehab units. And so our inpatient unit is about 50% COVID patients now, which obviously normally those are strokes and spinal cord injuries um, and, you know, severe debility. Um, so I think our, IC, or our IRUs are going to end up becoming kind of overwhelmed throughout the city and honestly throughout the country. And so I think we're going to see a lot of the um, PMNR outpatients getting pulled into the inpatient side of PMNR to help care for these patients long term, um, which has been kind of an interesting uh, transition over for a lot of my colleagues. So, you know, we're talking about trying to go back to outpatient practice, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, but I still, it's not going to be normal. We're still talking about ways to try to maintain social distancing and in a city that it's nearly impossible to do that in. Um, and so um, we have a lot of uh, different teams that have been developed to try to figure out what's the best way to utilize our fluoroscopy suites, what's the best way to utilize our ultrasounds, how many doctors are allowed to be in a clinic at a time, and how many patients are allowed to show up to that clinic. Our waiting rooms are basically shut down, so people are going to have to either wait outside or wait in their cars before they're allowed to come in. Um, and so that's been really interesting. Um, the self-quarantining thing has been really lonely, honestly. Uh, it's, it's hard. All my family lives in Canada, uh, so I've been trying to check on them. But, you know, friends, boyfriend, I haven't seen any of them in 30 days, which has been quite depressing. Um, and then when they, you know, they made that, that comment about the, uh, the immigration ban, that was just a <laughs> stab in my heart because I am, you know, Canadian. And it made me really nervous about, am I going to get kicked out of the country after this is all over? Um, lastly, we unfortunately lost one of our ER doctors, uh, to suicide over the weekend, uh, Dr. Byrne. Um, and that I think just was, that was a really hard, um, thing to learn for me because we know that PTSD is going to be a huge thing here, I think going forward for a lot of the healthcare providers and, you know, she's not the only one that this is going to happen to. And I think that the, the toll that it's going to take on a lot of the healthcare industry is, is pretty substantial. So. I don't think we're hearing Jason there either, but I'll just pick up things. People hear me okay? I see a few thumbs up. So I'm Andy Peterson. I'm a sports medicine doctor at the University of Iowa. I'm also a pediatrician by primary training, but I don't do much pediatrics anymore. I haven't really done any pediatric work for probably five, six years. Um, but in a previous lifetime, I used to be a pediatric hospitalist. I used to help take care of sick kids in the hospital. And so when things became you know, clear that we were going to have to back off from what we were doing in the sports clinic and in athletics, um, I was asked, I, I didn't wasn't told, I was asked that if I could come help out with the pediatric inpatient service. Um, my experience is a little bit different than what you've heard from the first two speakers. It hasn't been nearly as bad for me, partly because Iowa hasn't been hit nearly as hard as New York City has, partly because the pediatric population hasn't been hit nearly as hard. Uh, we've been fairly, fairly fortunate. Uh, we were pretty aggressive about trying to carve out a unit for just kids that um, either had COVID or were being ruled out for COVID, mainly to stop spread within the children's hospital. We have an awful lot of fragile kids that, that come through the children's hospital, and we really wanted to try to limit their exposure to it. So we created a separate COVID service, and that's what I volunteered for. Um, it's mainly been working nights, and frankly, we have not had a ton of COVID positive children. What we have had a ton of is rule outs. So all these kids with fever and neutropenia or some other illness or fever for no good reason or a transfusion reaction after their um, you know, chemotherapy or, or, or things like that, those are the ones that I'm getting. So I've had this um, kind of constant churn of you know, a, a half dozen to a dozen admits a night of very complicated kids, kids with underlying malignancy or adrenal insufficiency or glycogen storage diseases or other things that make them you know, somewhat difficult to um, take care of at baseline and fairly tenuous. So for me, you know, the challenging part of this hasn't been the medicine of it. The medicine has actually been fairly straightforward. It's been more the logistics. You know, I, I've been joking that I spent over an hour the other night trying to order cornstarch for a kid with glycerol kinase deficiency, right? Like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't do inpatient stuff. And so these more complicated 
um, types of, of admits have been challenging me from a logistics standpoint. I also want to make it clear that, you know, I'm not you know, doing anything special here at the University of Iowa. All of my partners have done something similar. So I'm really fortunate to work with a team of, of you know, really unflappable people, people who see a, a challenge or see an opportunity um, and, and, you know, go where they're needed. So, you know, one of my partners has been working in our um, acute illness clinic. One has been doing more ER shifts. One picked up some additional newborn nursery shifts. Some people have picked up some additional logistic or team coverage responsibilities. So everyone, you know, no one's really sitting at home on their butt. Everyone's found something to do to make themselves useful. And it's, it's, it's been a really great team to work with. Um, in terms of, you know, one of the questions we were asked to talk about is what's been the hardest part of this. And I commented about one of those, the kind of logistics of, of inpatient care. You know, the, the other part was the type of patients that we were going to have. You know, I anticipated seeing these fever and neutropenia kids and, you know, taking care of the pediatric oncologic population with their, you know, bald heads and the you know, look of fatigue in their eyes. That, that, that's always challenging. I think a lot of people have experienced that. Um, but the, the group that I wasn't ready for were the expectant mothers. So we started doing COVID testing on pregnant women before they delivered. And if they tested positive, they were separated from their baby after delivery. And we've had a pretty steady trickle of those. And it felt false, you know, me and my group to go counsel those women and to tell them, you know, your test came back positive for the you know, health of your child. We want to separate you for a while. And boy, those are, those are really hard conversations. Um, so I think that's probably been the most challenging part. Um, another question that was asked of us is what did we do to prepare? Well, I think I did the wrong thing to prepare. I spent a ton of time reading about COVID, right? I, I felt like I was really up to speed with what was in the literature and, you know, the recommendations and all those things. But what I should have been reading about is, you know, ordering TPN and fever and neutropenia and tumor lysis labs and transfusion reactions and aspiration pneumonia. Because, boy, these kids that you are getting admitted because they're sick and we're ruling out COVID, they're also sick, right? You don't want to lose track of the medicine that you're doing um, doing with, with these kids. Um, so I think that was probably the, the, the mistake that I made is I didn't really prepare for the, you know, the types of problems that I'd really be seeing. Luckily, things have calmed down for us already. We've had um, already a slight downtick in the number of pediatric cases here over the last couple of weeks. We never really did see a huge surge. Um, you know, we, we've had no more than a couple dozen total pediatric COVID cases um, in, in total. And so things uh, went pretty well for us. We've gotten off fairly easily. I have next. Audio might still not be working, so why don't we move on to Jeremiah Ray? Hey guys, I'm Jeremiah Ray. I am a, uh, I joined academic appointments uh, here at UC Davis, both in emergency medicine and in physical medicine rehabilitation. But a couple of years back, I shifted away from doing half sports, half emergency medicine, and now, now I just do 100% of my gig is sports medicine, and specifically to intercollegiate athletes only. And so, we have 25 teams here and I just cater to all of their needs. And uh, I also do not deserve nearly as much credit as the other badass doctors on here. I just want to be clear about that. Um, so I, I remember my wife and I, we, we read the, the newspaper that on February 2nd that Princess Diamond cruise ship had its first positive passenger. And I, I knew as an ER guy, I was going to get tapped to be helpful somehow. Uh, there were 300 Americans boarded there, and 177 of those Americans on, on February 5th were flown to Fairfield, California, where we have Travis Air Force Base. That's 23 miles from my clinic. And so uh, we, we knew it was going to get real pretty quickly here. And then on February 27th, I remember the very first documented case in the U.S. of community-acquired SARS-CoV-2 happened just 10 miles from, from me. And that's when the chair of emergency medicine told me to dust off my mitt as the first pitcher out of the bullpen if, uh, if things got a little gnarly out here. So the very next day, Friday the 28th, we called our lawyer, added our third baby to our will, and called, called our family members and just said, hey, this is where our kids are going to go in case we have an untimely death. And uh, my wife is also a family medicine doctor and helps staff some of the local urgent care. So we, uh, we thought we were going to get it. Initially, we had a lot of nervous energy, right, um, like all of you did. But my wife and I channeled this, and we had dedicated wellness time, so we, we – prioritized fitness, gratitude journal, looking at each other in our eyes and talking to each other. And actually as a family unit, we really came together, which was, which was pretty nice. And then I focused the rest of my energy onto really doing what Andy did. I just dove into the data 
And uh, I felt a lot of comfort in trying to better understand this. I never once went to social media or, or the major news outlets. I just kind of stuck with it was going to report actual factual cases, WHO, CDC, PubMed, MCPI became my buddies. And kind of my solace was actually just learning more. I'm sure like all of you, I was initially super psyched to learn about the spike protein binding to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. And that this AC receptor is specifically upregulated as you age and when you have endothelial dysfunction disorders like hypertension and cardiovascular disease. So I thought, that's awesome. That's not me. We're going to be good. My wife and I will make it through that. But then as Ben and, and Julie saw, young people started to get sick. And um, I think it was the Nguyen article um, out of OHSU that really showed that there's that human leukocyte antigen profile that shows some humans are relatively protected against this, just like the uh, HIV, um, there's an HLA antigen that some people are protected against that. And I was kind of crossing my fingers, hoping that I had the HLA B15030 type, you know. Um, but I, what I did was I converted my sports medicine clinic into an urgent care clinic, doing everything we can to keep our patient population out of the ER. Um, and then we just converted to a lot of telehealth, just like everybody else. But um, I, I wasn't prepared for the huge uptick in suicidal ideation, depression, anxiety. So we're taking hours of calls a day from our college athletes regarding these things. And shout out to Dr. Kevin Burnham and Marcy Faustine on taking huge, amazing leaps forward on, on dealing with this mental health crisis that we're feeling. And uh, I got asked to, to help on a multitude of committees here at UC Davis regarding uh, what is going to be sufficient PPE? What is a aerosol generating procedure? How can we reuse our PPE uh, safely? How do we need to sanitize our equipment safely? And really what we're doing now is we're focusing on athletes are trickling back to our campus. UC Davis is not closed. The campus is not closed. And so now we have to figure out how we're going to deal with these young, healthy people coming back to campus. And so if anyone is interested in, uh, in kind of a working group, we got a nice little conglomerate of of docs working on what do we do with these patients as they come back to campus. And so that's my next project that I'm having a lot of fun with. Thanks, Jeremiah. Moving on to uh, Dr. Scott. Okay, sorry. Okay, I am I unmuted now? Am I good? Okay, guys, um, I wanna, take a second just to thank again all the panelists and everyone out there um, who's been dealing with this. Um, you know, being in New York, being in Manhattan, um, as soon as we got the call to volunteer at HSS, I know that myself and all my colleagues kind of jumped up and said, we're here, we're available. Um, some of us available to go work in the hospital, other people kind of manning our outpatient urgent care centers that we've set up um, in the tri-state area. Um, it took some time, but HSS transitioned into something that is almost unrecognizable. For those of you who know HSS, you know it's a big orthopedic hospital, but we changed ORs into ICUs and um, floors where we would normally have post-op patients, we've had COVID patients. So I, along with Brett Torresdahl, who um, a lot of you know, um, make up COVID Team 5. And so we've been um, in the hospital three days on, three days off taking care of patients, many of whom who have been at New York Presbyterian and, and other hospitals and were transferred to us, most of them on supplemental oxygen and we've been managing their medical issues um, and weaning them off of oxygen and then discharging them home. Um, when I learned that that's what we would be doing, I thought, okay, you know, I, I can handle this. We can do this. This is not the ICU. I'm not intubating people. I'm not managing vents. I can do this. And maybe even almost had a false sense of security. Um, so I think it was my second set of three days there. Um, one of our patients who had just been looking so good, um, I thought he was going to go home the next day. And that next day, unfortunately, he just tanked. And so, you know, when you have, when you haven't done this in seven years and, and you, you know, you have to go back to putting someone on five liters by nasal cannula and 10 liters by non-rebreather and then you're calling the ICU and you're trying to get them there to intubate this patient, you know, you're thinking, what are we dealing with? And that's kind of what was going through my mind. Um, 
the hardest part, and I know people have heard people talk about this, is the fact that these patients can't have their family there and they don't have their family there. And so having known this guy for the few days I was there before and then knowing him again, I was kind of the last person that he saw before he got intubated, you know, and so you sit there and you get to talk to these people. And so, um, so I think that's probably been the hardest part of what we've been doing. Um, you know, he, he looked at me and he said, doc, I almost made it home. And am I going to fight this? Am I strong enough? And you're there to try to really, um, make these people feel better at a time when you don't have all the answers, you know? Um, and unfortunately, again, I talk about this false sense of security, went through that with him. And then the next day actually had it happen to another patient. Um, so this has just been one of these things where you go from seeing knee pain and shoulder pain, and then within a matter of weeks, you know, your world is 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 turned upside down along with everyone else in, in our area. And, you know, um, I just want to thank our hospital, HSS, the leadership's been great. Um, haven't been doing this alone. Like I said, Brett Torres has been there. John DeFiore, who's the head of our group, has also um, been on the wards and taking care of patients along with some of our other doctors. So, We've all been out there, um, you know, trying trying to do what we can. Um, as everyone else has said, things are slowing down. So my last day um, on the wards will be Thursday, and then we'll transition back to kind of taking care of patients outpatient, doing more telehealth visits. Um, but anyways, thank you for having me on the panel tonight, and I just want everyone to uh, stay safe. Yeah, that's great. Um, I hope Andy Meyer is working on this right now because our next video, our next uh, presenter is coming by telephone. That should be Dr. Romeo from the Rothman Institute in New York. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we got gotcha. you. Great. Uh, good evening, everyone, and um, congratulations on a, a very nice webinar. And uh, it's really quite impressive to hear um, all the the people that have spoken before me. Uh, so I'm honored to be on here. And I was asked to come on to basically share a personal experience uh, with COVID-19. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and I am the managing partner, senior member for the uh, Rothman Orthopedic Group in New York. And we've been taking care of patients uh, doing our orthopedic care. We knew uh, that the COVID-19 virus was in our community. We had heard stories about this. And as you saw from the very first speaker, um, one of the first cases was a gentleman who came back from Europe and, uh, and through his church and others, he ended up uh, transmitting the disease to a number of people. And that location is less than a mile from my house. And, but we really thought that everything would be fine. On Thursday, I had a great day in the OR uh, and I took my wife out for date night, Thursday night. We went to a wonderful restaurant in Manhattan. Uh, everything was fantastic. And uh, we went home and went to sleep at a reasonable hour. And I typically like to get up and work out in the morning before I go to work. And I had a case that morning that got canceled because the uh, lady was very concerned about this growing issue of COVID-19 and decided she wanted to wait on her elective shoulder replacement surgery. And as I got up and walked to the, to the uh, closet, I realized something was different. It was actually difficult to breathe as if someone had poured cement in my lungs. And I tried to take a deep breath and it was as if I had a corset or something not allowing me to take that deep breath. But I just kept moving forward and I, I went and changed into my gym clothes and went downstairs and noticed that even going down the stairs, my legs didn't feel quite right. And I uh, had some coffee. I sat in my room to do a little work and I was gonna get ready to go to the gym that was still open. And I realized my temperature was elevated. And I just, it was clear that this was all of the things I was worried that might happen. I called my friend at the emergency department uh, a little bit over an hour later and just told him and he said, well, why don't you come in and get checked? And um, I, my temperature was up, I had the symptoms. He tested me at that time. And this was uh, March 13th uh, for influenza and RSV. They were both negative. So he said, okay, we'll do the COVID test. Uh, it came back the next day positive. Um, they sent me home and uh, said, just kind of take it easy. And the next day we got the results that I was positive and my wife uh, had already started having symptoms. This was all complicated by the fact that we have at that time an eight month old uh, healthy baby daughter. And uh, 
at that time, we were, although we had heard really that the children had been spared, it was still quite concerning on how in the world we were going to take care of her as my wife was still breastfeeding and she was a daily part of our lives. And so that, as you have heard from many people, one of the biggest issues we've had with this whole thing is the anxiety that's been created uh, because of the unknown. We certainly are much better now uh, in terms of knowing what we do six weeks later, but when all of this was happening at once, despite what we knew from around the world, it all was quite hard to digest and understand how this really applied to us. Uh, on Monday, I received a hand-delivered note to my mailbox from the commissioner's office of the county that we live in that said that I had tested positive for a communicable disease, that I was restricted to being only in my house, and that should I leave my home, I was subject to criminal prosecution for spreading a communicable disease among the community. Um, that's the way it started out uh, six weeks ago. They also said that you could be released if you tested negative twice and were cleared by a physician. All of that, of course, was thrown out the window within a couple of weeks because as we've all heard, we did not have the tests. We were not prepared for what was happening in New York. And uh, although it was, we received the same information on January 20th of the first case in the United States that South Korea did, we had not been so, through SARS or MERS before and our public health care system and government was just not ready for this like South Korea was. And so we went very quickly from trying to just see if the disease was present and maybe we could control it. And literally in less than a week, it was all about mitigation and just do enough tests to find out who was symptomatic. And it was already very clear and everyone knew that many times patients would present without a fever, but testing for fever was one of the screening tests we were using in our office, which was turns out to be a complete waste of time. In the Northwell series, only one third of patients presented with a fever. And uh, they do get fever about 85, 90% during the actual illness, but early on you don't. And as again, as we've heard, the real interesting thing about this virus, uh, unlike the other coronavirus, is that there's a very high incidence of pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic people up to 40 or 50%. And so the disease spreads very rapidly. The other interesting thing about this virus is that it affects everybody differently. So clearly there's some interaction with who you are. And you may think that, well, you know, I work out every day, which I actually try to do. My wife was running two and three miles with a baby stroller uh, just a day or two before this. Um, within two days, it's hard to walk up a flight of stairs and not have to catch your breath. It just takes it away from you and just can't seem to get the breath that you want. And then the other thing that's quite interesting is that you go along and you wake up each morning, think it's going away and it doesn't go away. It's very tenacious. And then around sometimes between day seven and 10, it can either get a lot worse or you may gradually get better. In fact, in Germany, once you have the diagnosis, they actually have a team of people that stop by around one week to check on you because that's when a lot of people start to go in the wrong direction. Well, for me, I, on day seven, was really not feeling a lot better. I kept having a fever. And so I went ahead uh, and took the um, uh, hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax and zinc. And now I didn't do that lightly. I knew it was controversial. So I called my orthopedic friends, uh, both in the northern part of Italy, as well as in France. And they said, are you crazy? Yes, you should take this. Uh, a lot of us are doing it to be safe. And I know all about uh, the issues with regards to the problems with the heart and arrhythmias and everything else. I don't have any medical problems. I don't take any medications. And so I thought I would be safe uh, to do that. Within about 36 hours, I felt significantly better. My wife did not take it. She was very worried about the effect of hydroxychloroquine on the baby, not the Zithromax or zinc. And so she didn't take it. And to be honest with you, it's taken her a lot longer to get better it's not a controlled study. We don't know if the medicine is that helpful. It just seemed to affect her for much longer. And about 14 days, we were both feeling better, but I was substantially better. I had three days uh, uh, without uh, you know, any kind of symptoms and seven days without a fever around that period of time. And so I actually uh, went back to work around day 18. Um, my wife uh, struggled for quite some time. And even at week five, 
as she went in and uh, got evaluated with a chest X-ray and listened to her heart and lungs just to make sure she wasn't having some problem with her lungs because she still had trouble walking up a flight of stairs without catching her breath. And she's very, very healthy. And this is uh, remarkable. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I felt that I was likely to have some immunity, but as we've all heard, we don't really know for sure. I have not been tested for the immunoglobulins, but I elected to go back to work um, as you know, Daphne mentioned and the others within the uh, community of New York, there's a really compelling uh, just uh, feeling that we needed to help our community. Our residents at our hospital had uh, established a program where they were helping the intensive care unit prone patients. So our intensive care unit, like other facilities, grew uh, by a factor of almost 10. And um, every day, somewhere between 10 and 15 patients were identified by the head uh, pulmonologist and critical care physician as someone who would benefit from being in the prone position overnight. So the residents set up uh, a few weeks uh, before when I was ill, a program where they would start at three o'clock in the afternoon, they would get the list, and then they would be a team of five people and flip these patients. And uh, you know, it can be quite challenging. It's not just because some of the patients are larger, it's because they have one or two lines coming out of their neck, they have their endotracheal tube, uh, they'll have uh, their EKG leads, uh, they'll have lines in both arms, a Foley catheter, and some of them even with a check cess ray. And so it's a very complicated procedure. And I can tell you that at three o'clock we would do this and I went in and started helping them do this, but I was just a small part of it. I just was honored to be able to participate it in the, with them. And I was so impressed um, how they had kind of developed a system and worked with the intensive care unit people. And uh, they would stay that position for 16, 18 hours and we turn them back over at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, the sad uh, part of the realization of, of what we've done is we clearly do not understand how to treat this condition medically. And as you've heard, putting people on a ventilator uh, is not a great answer. In fact, at the study that was just published in JAMA uh, from this region, um, there was an 88% fatality rate of those people that went on a ventilator. Um, you almost wonder, like, why would you do that? And some people have asked that question. We are hopeful to show that we have at least twice the success. Uh, that's not I, what we'd like to see, but if we had 60% fatality or 40% surviving, considering the patients that were turning were the most severe, uh, we think that that is at least a win in some ways. But we have so much to learn about this disease, which it may come in through our upper respiratory system and affect our lungs, but the damage it does to the other organs, most likely through the way it affects our blood, the way the oxygen binds to the heme, and the way that that interferes uh, with uh, the uh, various systems, including our kidneys, our, our liver, and as you probably heard, four times increased incidence of large vessel cerebral vascular accident in, in people under the age of 40 because of this virus. And I think the thing that I learned more than anything is that um, while it does, uh, it is fatal primarily in people over the age of 60 to 65, it can make a lot of young people very sick and leave them with permanent uh, injury. So it's not a virus to be taken lightly. I, I, I did learn a few things and I'll finish up with that. And, you know, I, I, it was um, the, the, the challenge of this whole crisis and the virus has been very interesting. As uh, you've heard uh, Jeremiah say, uh, you know, and the challenges he had at home, uh, he and his wife and the family kind of regrouped and found a way to communicate well and support each other. And I think that's one of the real, one of the blessings. I, I know we hear about all the problems with domestic abuse and mental disease that happen, and certainly that's part of it. But the other side of it is taking this challenge and with significant others or your friends uh, figuring out how to support each other and work through it. And so many of these people on the front line have figured out a way to do that, which is remarkable. And we're all very, you know, impressed and honored uh, what uh, these young people have done over and over again, showing up every day, taking care of these people. And, and that's really been an incredible blessing. I will also mention that, you know, uh, in, in our field of medicine, we've learned a few things. One, we've learned that some systems, some groups, um, really have a hard time separating out the importance of commerce 
over the importance of their most valuable asset, which is people. And, and that's uh, uh, difficult to accept at times, especially when we're stressed and especially when we're threatened. And we've learned that some, uh, some people make a wrong decision and try to create uh, rules and regulations that are there because of, of the fact that we have um, a, a lack of personal protective equipment or we're not prepared and they jeopardize the safety of the people that work for them. And I, I really think that that's uh, something that comes out and the leaders that have done well are the ones that have been open and transparent and communicated well and work together as a team to solve this problem. So these are really good lessons that we've learned. And I, I think that despite the tragedy that we've seen in New York, and it has been tragedy, it's worse than anywhere else in the world when you take all the numbers together, which is really sad, is that we're going to come out of this with a tremendous amount of innovation and new ideas on how to care for the people in our population, how to, how to do a better job with our health care in general. And I think in terms of refocusing on our priorities, you know, it's very clear that the entire healthcare system is built on elective surgery. And, and, you know, that's a remarkable thing that's happened that so many orthopedic practices and sports medicine practices and hospitals are almost to the brink of bankruptcy because they can't do elective surgical procedures. Well, maybe it's time to finally move them out of hospitals and do them in ambulatory surgery centers and create environments where these kind of illnesses can affect that and use the hospitals correctly uh, for the more ill conditions and the things that we've seen. And we've learned a lot about how to preserve uh, the resources that we have, how to get the resources. We've learned we can't depend on a global supply. And we've also learned that having 50 different healthcare systems, because we have 50 different states, doesn't really do very well uh, when you have a disease that affects everybody equally or pretty equally. Somehow the West Coast obviously has had less of the problems we've had on the East Coast. And so I think that there's a, I'm very happy that my wife and I are better. Um, We did get very ill. In fact, uh, for three nights, I checked my wife's uh, um, oxygen saturation with a pulse oximeter because she was having trouble breathing and she was around 18 to 20 breaths per minute. And um, she really had to sit up a few times. We put her in the prone position. We did what we could to try to, and I was very close to bringing her to the hospital Uh, but she kind of pulled through it um, because of her youth and otherwise. And I think to some degree, because as a mom, she had to be there for her nine month old. And so she would do anything to make sure uh, that that connection stayed in place. And so we had a tough time. We didn't have to be hospitalized. We know people that have become very ill. We know people who have died uh, in our community and that's sad. And my hope is, is that we learn from this in many, many ways, and then we come out stronger and better. And the next time something like this happens, we all respond from the very beginning uh, in a way that we should uh, in this country with the way we take care of healthcare and take care of a lot of people. And we have to make sure we keep those priorities in place. So again, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to share my experience. I really admire all of the work that that you have all done. And uh, and I uh, I just, really proud to be a physician in the healthcare system uh, during this challenging time. All right. Thank you, Dr. Romeo. Oh, we got Jason back. Who would have thought? Yeah, with three minutes to go. Um, uh, so Dr. Romeo, thank you so much. I, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, this is, this has been an amazing hour and 15 minutes. I hope the uh, 230 plus members that are on um, have enjoyed this. This is being recorded. We have time, I believe, for one question uh, before we need to switch over for Dr. Mountjoy's talk. Um, And again, we only have a minute or two, so I'm going to pose this to Dr. Peterson since he is the uh, the head of uh, sports medicine at the University of Iowa. Uh, Do you have any answers or lessons that may be able to be applied for college training rooms or athletic training rooms uh, for student athletes as they return to campus, understanding that we may not have them right now. Yeah, so I think you're going to see a lot of guidelines coming out pretty quickly here. Um, USOPC released some information today. Big Ten has released some information. Um, there, there's going to be some more stuff trickling out. 
What we're trying to do here is take advantage of the same things we took advantage of in the hospital. And so we're using our hospital epidemiologists and public health people to work with us in our collegiate athletic training facility. So I think it's next week I'm walking through all of our facilities with our hospital epidemiologists to help us identify targets, uh, places where we might be able to mitigate infection um, spread. Uh, also working with the public health people to make sure that when we do reopen this, if there is some type of surge or increase in the number of cases that we're detecting that, but that doesn't fly under our radar to make sure that we're aware of a problem if we create a problem. I wish we could take more questions. Um, this has been amazing. Uh, this session has been recorded. Um, I know uh, Andy Meyer is in the background and we'll make sure we send this out to our membership. If there are more questions, by all means, you can email. I'm sure any of our uh, presenters or panel, we'd be more than happy to share more stories. But uh, in the interest of time, and as a courtesy, we want to make sure we get off of this link, and everyone who's registered uh, will get back on to hear Dr. Mountjoy talk, and Dr. Mosinovac will be introducing her. Thank you, everyone, especially with such a change in the last minute, and uh, we'll see everybody again in about nine minutes. Bye.